Uh, we got a really special morning this morning as Jackie prayed at his Father's Day. And so we have uh, a bit of a, uh, a treat for us this morning. We've got three people that will be coming and sharing with us different aspects of uh, fatherhood. And uh, so could you put your hands together, please, for Sarah Gray. Sarah's going to come on up and share with us this morning. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Happy Father's Day. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity to share the word with you so much. <laughs> and I only hope to have the Lord speak through me today. Okay. Um, today I wish to discuss the importance of being a godly father and the significance of having a relationship with your heavenly father. I believe in relation to this occasion, it is integral to consider the vitality of a father to effectively reflect the characteristics of God, to be a role model for those surrounding. But why is it so important? Well, fathers are observed constantly, whether you're aware of it or not. This isn't just in relation to children. Fathers are observed by their friends, co-workers, and other fathers as well. If you claim to be a follower of God, onlookers will see your actions and connect them with that of God. This can be detrimental to the way they view God. It is never enough to claim to love God than indulge in careless characteristics. James 4.17 states, if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. To know the way to act and to deliberately ignore the responsibility is insanely foolish. Whether you like it or not, people will look to you. Your child looks to you and sometimes mimics your behaviour. Would you like your child to grow up like you? to have your characteristics and mannerisms? If there is any hesitation in your answer, you should reflect on the way in which you conduct yourself. It is so easy to hear what is said in church and forget. It is so unbelievably important to listen and to act upon the words that we hear. Don't let these messages be wasted. Don't be a shadow in the crowd. James 1, 23 to 25 says, Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately, immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law and that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. To have a godly father is to have a role model that you can see God in. One that is gentle, slow to anger, and has a deep love for God. Someone that you can go to with questions or concerns. As an early teenager, I would tell my dad things I was struggling with or concerned about, and he would never, ever fail to bring God into the situation. At the time, that would annoy me so much. <laughs> He would answer with, oh, have you prayed about it? And I would kind of roll my eyes or give a little grunt in annoyance because I knew he was right. And I can genuinely say that my dad has never given me a worldly answer to a question. He has always found a way to weave God into it. As I'm older now, I still talk to him about my concerns and he still does the same thing. Except this time I'm much more grateful. Instead viewing his obedience to God to be admirable. Although it can be incredibly challenging to replicate God's characteristics, it truly comes down to what is in one's heart. If you are fully committed to representing God and you make decisions every day that are based around him, there is no doubt that others will see God in you. No doubt. If you draw closer to God, God will draw closer to you. 
and in doing so, he will shine through you. I'll ask the question again. Is God being seen in you? Would you be proud if those around you replicated your mannerisms? Today may be a difficult day for some of us. Those with tattered relationships with their fathers, those who have suffered the loss of a father, those who wish deeply to be a father. As solemn as the occasion may be, it serves as a reminder that this life is temporary. These relationships, although meaningful, are temporary. The only everlasting relationship that we have is between ourselves and the Heavenly Father, a Father that never leaves us and never, ever fails us. When I think of God as my Father, I connect myself with the story of the prodigal son. (laughs) It hurts me to admit it, but there was a time, a whole year, where I would sit. I sat right in this church, and I, I absolutely hated God. Physically, I was so close to God, but spiritually, I couldn't be more far. When I was 17, I struggled helplessly with depression. I believe God was the reason for this. God put these thoughts in my head. I thought that God had left me, was punishing me, and that my life had no worth to it at all. These thoughts made me bitter, and I strayed further and further from God. After barely getting through my time without God, I asked him back, embarrassed and ashamed of the thoughts I had believed. (laughs) Sorry. Like the father in the parable, God took me back and I found him there waiting for me to know the truth. Luke 15, 24 For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. To those of us who feel like our relationship with God is strained, I remind you of Romans 8, verse 28. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God's arms are wide open. He's the most perfect example of a father. He himself is perfect. I have spent a long time with God and a long time without him. There is no questioning which one has filled my heart more. (laughs) The love I have felt and the love that I have for God is beyond all understanding. I'm so unbelievably thankful for the heartache and the pain because it has moulded me into the person I am today. God's undying love for us is undeniable. He's the greatest father to replicate and by far the greatest father to be loved by. As we spend time with our friends and family, I urge you to remember, no matter how your relationship is with your earthly father, our heavenly father is always there with a love that will never fail. Thanks. Glasses have to come on to read. (laughs) So, we often judge ourselves, um, uh, judge the level of success by the visible and obvious outcome in front of us. If we're an athlete, which I'm not, (laughs) we don't end up on the podium getting a medal. Uh, then we can criticise ourselves and we feel as though we have failed. If we study day and night and try to get the marks that we want and yet the results don't come back the way we hoped for, we can feel as though we failed. I'm sure there's lots of examples that you can apply to your life and where the result just has not met the expectation. Being a dad or a mum can have that same effect on us. We start out with these great ideas of how things are going to be. And you put in so much time and energy, but sometimes things just don't go to plan. 
and the result just does not meet your expectation. Kylie and I got married today, 29 years ago. 3rd of September, 1994. My dad told us he would always remember our wedding anniversary. It's the same day that World War II started. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> our plan was to wait five years and then start a family of our own. At the five-year mark, we both felt still too young and still too immature to have a family. One of those things changed. We're not too young. Probably still too immature, but anyway. Um, but we decided to wait a few more years. Then one day, we were walking through Ballina Fair. There was a foster agency trying to bring awareness to the need for more foster carers. We both just stopped and looked at each other and said, hey, we should do that instead of having our own kids. That looks like something that we would enjoy doing. That looks like us. So we did. So over the last 22 years or so, we've been the mum and dad to eight different young people. Not all at the same time. We're not that silly or adventurous. Some were only for weekends for a month. Some were for full time for a month. One was for a whole year. And then the last two, many of you know, and they were with us for 15 or 16 years. All of them I look at as my children, by which I mean God placed them into my home for a reason. They could have gone to any other foster carer's home, but no, they were in mine, and divinely placed there by God. Why? I don't know. They just were. But what could I give them? Love, shelter, food? Yeah, sure. But they can get that from lots of other foster carers too. But we also had God's love to give them. They have all been constantly prayed for. They all heard about the love of Jesus and what he has done for us. Admittedly, some were still babies. They won't remember it, but they were around it. I know that for certain, three of them have made their own commitment to God and they received him as their own Lord and Saviour. And what a joy that is for every parent to have. But now they're all adults. They're out living their own life. I don't know of what their walk with God is anymore. I've had to hand that baton over to God and say, God, I've done my best in raising them in the ways that you would have me to, but now they're off doing their own thing. Please look after them and place other people in their life to help them navigate their way through. But my job as a godly father doesn't stop there. Once they leave home, or once they are no longer in my care, or once you no longer have contact with them, caring for them goes beyond the physical. It still happens in the spiritual through prayer. I admit, it's nowhere near as much as what I know I should be, or how much I'd like it to be, but it is the most powerful way that I can care for my children now. It always has been, and always will be, the one thing that nobody can take away from me. About 20 years ago, Kylie and I ran a youth group at the church we were involved with. And some of these teenagers seemed to spend more time in our house than they were at their own. I'm sure of it. Their parents always knew where to come looking for each afternoon or weekend. Some of these kids were quite uh, challenging, for want of a better word, for their parents and the school that they were in. They were often suspended or grounded. But their parents kept telling us that they will never stop letting their son or daughter hang out at our house or coming to church or youth group with us because they always came home afterwards a much better or more likeable person. This was coming from parents that openly told us that they would never go to church themselves they would, but they also admitted that there was something different about the, their kids and when they hung out at our house. 
we were getting the same feedback from the school chaplain, as he was often the one that had to help out with the school issues. All we were doing was being a godly influence, a friend, a pseudo-parent, if you like, to these teenagers. They were part of our extended family. Were we their natural family? No. But God did place us together for a time to be a family of sorts to them. I don't see many of these guys or girls anymore, but one thing I can still do is pray for them, and nothing can stop me from doing that. Back when I was about 20, I went to Papua New Guinea for three weeks with a crew of 13 people to help build a house for a missionary. While we were there, we got to meet a bunch of other missionaries around the Highland area where we were working. One family I was introduced to, the wife started to cry and gave me a hug. Freaked me out, to be a little honest. A 20-year-old guy having a random woman crying and hugging me. She said, you must be Mrs Polly's son. She sends birthday cards every year to my children and prays for them every week. That means so much to all of us. And then to meet one of her children is such a blessing. I did not even know that my mum did that. But I found that out once I got back home, that she did that for missionary kids all over the world. They weren't even her own kids or grandkids, but someone else's. But she made them one of her own by loving and caring for them, and enough to make their day special when they couldn't be with their own natural grandparents. You know, I've told you these stories of my life to point out the importance of being a godly father or a godly mother, whether you're the natural father of a child, the uncle, the grandfather, or like me, a foster carer, or maybe you're a single parent family taking on the role of raising your kids alone. However it is, whatever your situation, even if you don't have kids, but there are kids somewhere in your life and you have input into their life, let it be a godly input. As a father, as a parent, you become a leader, a teacher, an example to follow, a comforter, as well as many other things. This even happens within your wider community. Your family grows. Jesus never had any children of his own, but he did have a wider community, a people that became his family. He had invited these 12 guys, the disciples, to be his closest family to hang out with. These guys he led, he taught, he prayed with, he prayed for, he was an example for which they could follow, and he comforted them. He was not their dad in the natural sense, but he did do all the same things a dad is supposed to do for his children. There have been many great people in this world that have left their mark. They are known for what they have achieved. Great sportsmen, men and women, great scientists, great inventors. You can go on. But what are you going to be known for once you are no longer here? What is your family going to put on your headstone? I, here lies, lies so-and-so. He was a great golfer or a great musician, whatever it might be. I'm going to show you uh, my parents' headstone. If we can have that photo put up, please. There. That's my parents. Uh, David John Polly and the date. It's got, he prayed, and same with my mum, she prayed. That's what they're known for. You know, not only just by all us children that are there, but all the people that was in their world, or all, their, all their church friends, they would have known them as they prayed. You know, what a great honour to be known as that. You know, this is not about me. This is not about my mum and dad. It's about the importance of being a godly parent. What a great honour we can give our children than to pray for them. You know, there's two things left I want to tell you. This one here now is actually for the children. Kids, pray for your parents. 
It's not always an easy job being a parent. Along with all the other growing up things we have to do, sometimes we don't get it right. But we will always love you. And the other thing, uh, it's been, getting up here has been something that's been quite nerve-wracking for me. And I've been struggling with anxiety about it a bit this week. In the last three days, I've been getting uh, on my phone an app that comes up with devotions, and it's all been anxiety for the last three days. So it's probably been, this has been more for me maybe than it has been for you. But this morning, the, 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 the verse said, was Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. Because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish, for his mercies never end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And that also applies to being a parent. Thank you. to thank my grandchildren for being here today. It uh, was a surprise and a blessing, and I thank you. The three stages of spiritual growth. <clears throat> 1 John 2, 12 to 14, NIV. I am writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who was from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. And I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. <clears throat> Three stages of spiritual development are given. Children, young men or teenagers and fathers or adults, these stages have no relation to physical age or gender or person. A Christian who is 70 years old in the flesh may still be a spiritual baby. A Christian lady of 30 years old may have the maturity to be a spiritual father. In the parable of the sower, Jesus describes three types of harvest. The seed that fell on good ground and brought forth fruit. Some yielded a hundredfold some 60-fold and some 30-fold, Matthew 13, 8. <clears throat> spiritual children, all believers are God's spiritual children. This refers to all Christians. Before we have fellowship with God, we must be born again. We are all God's children because our sins are forgiven for his name's sake. And it is by Jesus and God's word that our spiritual birth is made possible. 1 Peter 1, 23, all NIV I might mention. <clears throat> Some believers are little children. Galatians 4, 6, Paul says, because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Galatians 4, 13 to 14, 
Paul says, as you know, it was because of my illness that I first preached the gospel to you. And even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. They have known the Father. The first expression of a child is the recognition of his parents. The Spirit calls, causes all God's children to know him. Galatians 4, 6, Romans 8, 15 and 16. <clears throat> Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they be born again. Romans 8, 15, 16. The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Some characteristics of little children. They are needy, carefree, selfish, unknowing, and demanding. Spiritual fathers. Spiritual fathers have taken time to walk with God. <clears throat> In both verses 13 and 14, John says, Fathers are those who, who have known him from the beginning. Children have known him, but fathers have known him from the beginning. The difference between a young and an adult Christian is time and obedience. Father, teach the seed of salvation. Fathers, teach the seed of salvation and teach your church how to cultivate the hearts and minds into a fertile place where their relationship with God can grow. A physical child is usually considered an adult after 18 to 21 years of growth. <clears throat> How long does it take for a baby Christian to become a mature Christian? Paul first came to Corinth in AD 50. About five years later, we see what Paul wrote to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 3, 2 to 3. If you have been saved five years, you should be a father. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who leave, live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since this is jealousy and quarreling among you, you are worldly. <clears throat> Characteristics of spiritual fathers. Fathers reproduce, instruct, love, provide, and protect. Spiritual young men, 13, 14. Spiritual young men, no conflicts. Young men are at war with the enemy. Little children don't know how to fight and resist Satan. Spiritual fathers have already won these battles since they learned to live in dependence 
upon God the Father. <clears throat> Spiritual young men abide in the word. Psalm 119.11, I have written your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Putting the word to work in our lives enables us to defeat Satan. Psalm 119.11, this is why Satan will always fight serious Bible study. You cannot become a Christian without spending time and learning your Bible. <clears throat> Jesus used the scripture to defeat, station, to defeat Satan at his temptation. Each time he said, it is written. James 4, 7. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. <clears throat> Psalm 119, 11. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Three steps for moving to spiritual maturity. If a healthy baby is cared for, it will grow. A teenager with proper provision and training will grow. Growth is automatic, both physically and spiritually, when we are healthy. Step one, eat, feed on the word of God. Step two, rest, rest in Jesus. Learn to rely on his strength. Learn to live in total dependence upon him. Step three, exercise. Trust and obey our Father God. Get busy. Conclusion, the Chinese, Chinese bamboo doesn't seem to grow at all the first four years. However, during a 60-day period in its fifth year, it shoots up to 90 feet. Don't know what the other modern expression is for 90 feet. Brethren, isn't time, brethren, isn't it time to grow in the Lord by now? 1 John 2, 12, 14, NIV. I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I'm writing to you, dear fathers, because you know him who was from the beginning. I'm writing to young men because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God, unless they are born again. Thank you. I get the worship guys back. We might finish with a finish with a song. Hey, that was awesome. Thank you so much, all three of you, uh, for what you shared with us this morning. Uh, it was one of those mornings where I feel like I've just had a buffet of stuff laid out before me, and uh, I've picked this and grabbed that, and the Lord's spoken several things to me here this morning that I want to go and dwell on and, and, and think about. But um, uh, great, rich heritage of faith that you shared with us in such a short time. Bruce, we really appreciate it, mate. Thank you so much.
And good on your grandkids for coming as well. You guys, I hope you notice that. And when one day when I'm... Should be here every Sunday. Yeah, fair call. Fair call. I hope, I hope all the children here heard that. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, we're going to, um, we're going to, we're going to finish with a, a song of worship. Now, before you leave uh, this morning, I know some of you may have places to go. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident that all of your kids are taking your fathers out somewhere and blessing them and, you know, shouting them and treating them like kings. I'm sure that's happening for all of us. Uh, but on the way out, we've actually got uh, a barbecue on out there. So it's just sausage sandwiches. So uh, if you want to hang around, you're more than welcome to hang around as long as you want. Grab a sausage sandwich, mingle, hang out. Uh, if you're running to the car, that's fine. Why don't you go and grab a sausage sandwich anyway on your way to the car? Uh, tip for anyone that said they're going to take their father home and cook him lunch. Just grab sausage sandwiches, put them in a bag, take them home and already done for you. Feel free to do that uh, as well. But we're going to just worship God. Uh, look, if you if, 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 if you would like prayer this morning, we'd love to pray uh, for you. If there's been anything that's been said this morning, something that's really impressed upon you, you feel like the Holy Spirit's speaking to you, uh, we, we want to open up the front as we do every week for prayer. You don't have to come up the front for prayer. If, if you want to turn to somebody there with you, why don't you turn to somebody next to you and say, hey, look, I feel like God's been speaking this to me. Would you pray for me? Because we know one thing, we're going to walk out of that door and the birds of the air and the enemy is going to come and he's going to to pull every little seed of what God has spoken to your heart this morning. He's going to try to take it away. So by the time you get home, you've forgotten it uh, and it's, it's moved out of your world. That's what's going to happen. We know that. It happens every week. So while you're here right now, if you feel like the Lord's speaking to you, why don't you share with somebody else and to pray with you? Maybe you're here this morning and you've, you know, speaking about fathers, bring some stuff up for you, which I know it does uh, for many of us. I've had my own journey with my own upbringing and my childhood and the concept of God as a father. And we'd love to stand with you this morning and pray for you if that's a, a, a thing that you feel is going on for you this morning. If you're sick in this place, we believe in a God that heals. We'd love to pray for you. Uh, any other reason that you have, we'd love to stand in faith with you and pray. Uh, otherwise, as I said, grab somebody there. It doesn't have to be out the front. God doesn't work better up here than he does down there. Amen. God works everywhere.